Síðasta einndi fyrir hlé verður flutt af Kæti Kerli Kerner. So I'm going to switch to English while introducing her. She is the Strategic Planning Director of the Estonian Ministry of Economic Affairs and Communications. And her talk is called Estonia's Journey and Lessons Learned Towards Becoming a Fully Digital Country. So Kæti Kerli Kerner, the stage is yours. Uh, hello from me. Uh, as I was introduced, my name is Kaidi. I'm really happy to be here and thank you so much for inviting us. Uh, it is my very first time speaking about Estonia, Estonia's solutions and um, what other countries may want to learn from our mistakes and lessons. It's the very first time I'm speaking with people who are from a smaller country than us. <laughs> it's quite a challenge <laughs> to find that country. And I think what is wonderful is that um, it's so much easier to exchange experiences with a country that has the same and similar issues and, and struggles. Uh, that doesn't have endless finances, that doesn't have endless resources when it comes to people, uh, that has to really strategically think uh, before taking any steps and really think ahead uh, because any of the resources that we have are, are not that, um, it's not smart to spend them uh, unwisely. So it's, Really wonderful to be here. Uh, just a quick question. Where's the clicker for the slides? <laughs> it's in the podium. OK, perfect. Thank you. Uh, so uh, my role in the, in the ministry is a strategic planning director. Uh, and I'm going to talk about a couple of lessons. I'm going to go th through like a little school day with you. We're going to have a history lesson, a bit of a math lesson, a bit of a art history lesson. And if we're all good students, maybe we won't have extra homework, but I won't guarantee that. Um, so why being here today is extra important. Uh, Estonia celebrated its um, anniversary, 30th anniversary of regaining its independence just last week. And I think it's very relevant to remember that Iceland played a very big role and a very big part uh, in that era 30 years ago. Now, you guys and us, we, um, we had a very similar path, or we were going on a, walking on a very similar road, uh, getting our independence in 1918. In 1944, however, history took a very different path uh, for the both of us. Uh, we were occupied by the Soviet Union, and uh, this photo is actually uh, taken decades ago, decades ago. Uh, it is from a square that, or a town hall square that didn't have a name at that point. Um, and that's a statue of Lenin during the Soviet Union. Uh, the statue was there about 40 years. Um, and it was taken down in 1991. Forgive me for the photo, it's not a particularly beautiful photo because it was taken two days ago uh, with my very old iPhone. So, but this square is actually, this building is the Minister of Foreign Affairs and this square is Iceland Square. <laughs> so, Iceland was the very first country in the world to recognize Estonians, Estonia's uh, independence in 1991, just two days after we declared or redeclared our independence. So Iceland has a very 
we have a very soft spot for Iceland. Uh, and knowing especially that you're a small country, so any kind of a big gesture is even a bigger gesture coming from you guys. And it was actually a very rare occasion. Uh, as far as I know, it's the only square that's named after a country in Estonia. It's a very rare occasion uh, politically to do this. Uh, so whenever you're in Tallinn, uh, do, it's in the middle of the city centre. But coming to the Estonia's uh, journey in the past 30 years. So we've, what have we been up to? Quite a lot. If you have nothing, then it's very easy to build something. It's a lot difficult, a lot more difficult to tear something down and then start building it. A lot easier, uh, I'm trying to be an optimist here, a lot easier to build something if you don't have anything. So 30 years ago, we basically didn't have any online systems, any digital systems. Uh, we didn't have uh, legacy systems. That's why we don't have to struggle with legacy systems as much as many other bigger countries, for example. Uh, and what have been we been doing the past 30 years? So Estonia is covered by broadband connection the whole country. 99% of our state services, public services, are online. The only, there are two things in Estonia that you can't do uh, online. You have to actually physically show up to do. Uh, any guesses what those two things are? You can't get married and you can't get divorced online. <laughs> Uh, before the coronavirus, uh, you, could, you couldn't also buy and sell property online. So you couldn't uh, sell a house or buy a business. You, ha you would have to physically show up. Uh, due to the coronavirus, we changed that. So notaries, if they allow it, are allowed to um, do the transaction with two parties uh, digitally and confirm uh, the two parties digitally. Uh, the reason why we don't do marriages and divorces online is, or the reason we didn't do businesses so far as well online was that um, we just wanted to be extra sure that the person wasn't coerced into this de decision. Uh, so we would, they, they would be have to, there would have to be a person to check that, yes, you actually do want to marry this person uh, or you actually do want to divorce them. Uh, so that's why those two services are still physical. Uh, all of the other state services, public services in Estonia are online. Uh, I only need to sign up, used to need this ID card. Now I don't even need this. My phone is enough uh, to sign uh, and log on and do health, uh, see my health situation or my doctor's appointments, do my taxes online, um, register my car, so on. The usage of e-services in Estonia grows about 7% each year. Uh, our budget is roughly around 1% of our state uh, GDP. Uh, so the budget for all e-services uh, and e-infrastructure. So a brief history lesson. Uh, how did we get to this point? How did we get to the point where we have 99% of our services online uh, and people actually really do use them and prefer to and demand using everything online and get very frustrated if they can't use it or if a system is down for two seconds. So we started off uh, with e-banking. It's, in my opinion, it's a very smart thing to start with something that people use every day uh, and need to use every day, which is money. So we started off with e-banking, moving our banking online accessing finances online. Uh, as I said, 
The next thing was an ID card, which was very relevant because it gave a identity, a digital identity to every and each person in Estonia. So every adult person, but preferably kids as well, should have an ID card and their own personal ID number. The ID number is not a, mm, it's not sensitive information. So for example, you guys can know my ID number, you can't do anything with it, you can't harm me in any way. Uh, it can be public information, uh, but it is a very relevant piece of information uh, when uh, I want to identify myself. Tiger Leap was, uh, in the late 90s, early 2000s, a project run by the government to support that all of the schools in Estonia would be online and would have access to uh, high quality IT education, uh, starting from first grade. X-Road is something that you guys are aware of already, I heard. Even Icelandic, I heard uh, it may, being mentioned before. Uh, X-Road is a information way we share information between public institutions. Uh, I'll come back to that a bit later. Uh, once only principle was very important. So deciding and making sure, and we still try to make sure and make sure that uh, if I go and tell, let's say, some kind of institution or a ministry or DMV or whatever organization, public organization, if I give them my information, where I live, what's my phone number, um, the once only pr principle states that uh, other public service organizations basically are not allowed to ask this information from me again. They have to get it from their systems. Uh, so I don't have to tell my name and my phone number and my address over and over and over, over again every time I communicate with a public sector institution. And this kind of really forced um, public sector institutions to rethink how they do things uh, and really internally look at their processes instead of uh, asking the client or the customer or the person uh, over and over again things. Digital signature, being the first country in the world to use officially digital signatures, so we do sign everything online now. Uh, I haven't physically signed a document in years. Mm, a brief his history lesson in, in what we've learned uh, you can't only learn from successes, you learn from uh, bad situations as well. Estonia was also the first, if or one of the first countries in the world who was actually, as a state, uh, cyber attacked. In 2007, uh, we had a political situation in Estonia where the government wanted to move a statue in the middle of the uh, capital. Uh, it turned into a very um, uh, strenuous uh, situation with uh, the local Russian population. And it resulted in Estonia being cyber attacked for days and for a couple of weeks after this um, in 2007. So this was an actual attack towards the state. Uh, many of our websites, state websites, banks were offline due to these cyber attacks. This taught us to really look at cyber security, uh, really put effort, finance and resources into making sure that everything works, everything stays online. And I'll come back to that, how we're trying to make sure that our country stays online, even if we physically may not even exist. Uh, the cultural and other reasons why Estonia kind of made it as far as we did is I think it's a very important thing to look at the cultural situation, not only the technical side of it. 
uh, it is the personalized ID numbers that I was telling you about before. Uh, Estonians didn't have a cultural issue with being identified by a number. Now, this is something that doesn't fly in many countries. Uh, I think Germans cannot even picture a culture, again, where every person is identified by a number of, for obvious historic reasons. Uh, Estonians don't have that cultural background, so we didn't have a problem with everyone having a specific number uh, and that number being a way to identify us. In the late 90s, early 2000s, public sector, unlike in many countries, was the driving force behind innovation. When it came to, came to investing, when it came to creating solutions, um, the public sector was the leading force behind innovation. And it, in many ways, still is. Uh, that meant we were able to do very quick and very big decisions. For example, implementing ID cards, implementing e-voting. Um, so we don't vote, or you can vote physically, but uh, you can also vote digitally for the past 16 years now, for our parliament, for the European parliament, for local elections. Uh, I personally haven't voted physically uh, for the past 15 years. And I can do it from Iceland if I want to. There are elections coming up in October, so. Um, so we didn't have, as I said, we didn't have a legacy issue. Uh, and we're a small country. So this is where Iceland kind of, uh, we're similar. It's a lot easier to implement change in a small country. Uh, it's a lot easier, it's a lot quicker because you have a lot less people to run your ideas by. Uh, you can make change happen a lot quicker, experiment with things, even if they don't work out. Um, Uber and Taxify uh, both were allowed very quickly to operate in Estonia because we were, hey, let's try it. Let's see what happens. Um, of course, there were kind of setbacks. Of course, there were uh, objections to this, but we're willing to try and see. Um, so the X road, which is an important way of uh, us exchanging information between public sector offices and uh, ministries and institutions and agencies. Uh, what we've learned is we have to change that a bit as well. XRO used to work basically like this. So um, if I would go to, let's say, uh, let's say, I'm going to go and register my car. I'm going to go to the DMV, that's point A. Now they have to ask or check if I am who I say I am. That's why they're sending a question to B, let's say it's a population registry. Uh, right now the way it works is um, if B isn't working or is offline or is broken, uh, basically the A will just stand there and wait for an answer. That may come, but never know when. The way we want to do it is a lot different. Instead of being like, um, if you use Facebook Messenger to uh, chat with anyone, you'll, and you wanna know something, instead of asking and sending a message to one person, uh, we wanna make it so that you basically ask, just throw the question out there, and if there's someone else who knows, so you throw a question basically into a chat room, uh, it's a very simplified way of explaining it, uh, and if there is anyone else who knows the answer to this question, uh, the answer can come quicker, and they can reply to that. So it's still changing systems that we've understood work really well, 
but might not work in under some circumstances, and how to change that. So, what our current big topics are that we are dealing with is e-residency. Uh, Estonia is the first country to offer e-residency for people who are not residents of Estonia. Uh, so, validating them as people, as a person, and allowing them access to the European market or Estonia's market, allowing them to set up a business. Uh, that's a very different way of thinking, thinking that the population of your country is not just the people who hold your passport, but other people may want to have access to your services as well. A uh, very big topic is data embassy, coming back to what I said about being a country even if uh, you don't have a physical country anymore. Uh, so, a couple of years ago, uh, we set up our data embassy uh, in Luxembourg. Right now we have 10 of our state um, data systems in that embassy in Luxembourg. So what that means is if we were to be physically uh, occupied tomorrow, uh, or let's say everything you own burns down and you don't have a single document to prove who you are, and the population registry burns down uh, and they don't have a single document to prove who you are and what you own, uh, that information is still in Luxembourg. So you can literally not lose your country or the information you have about your people. Cross-border services. Now, this is where NIS, uh, Estonia is part of NIS, uh, uh, Nordic Institute for Interoperability Systems. Uh, and we're very, very happy to have uh, Iceland there as well. But uh, it's very important to build cross-border services as well. Uh, we're not physically in the same country all the time. We want to travel, we want to use different services in different countries. Uh, we have ongoing services with Finland right now. So, for example, people who have medical prescriptions in Finland can cash them or get them in Estonia and vice versa. So, building those cross-border services is a very important topic for us as now. And proactive services. Um, this is my personal favorite topic, is proactive services and why we need them. And this is a short math lesson, why we need proactive services, uh, or what proactive services actually do. Uh, I understood the need for proactive services when I saw uh, a friend of mine's Instagram post. She's American, well, she's Estonian who moved to America. So she has had her education in Estonia, now lives in the United States. And she was doing her taxes. Our favorite thing to do during the year, isn't it? Now, for an average American, uh, doing taxes takes about eight hours. Filing taxes uh, to the tax board takes, on average, three hours. Now, she was angry. <laughs> She was frustrated because she was asking why we had to learn so much high-level math instead of learning how to do our taxes. And I think she's not the first or the last person to ask that question. Why do we have to study the things we just study in school instead of studying the things that we actually need to use every day? Um, so, brief math lesson. Uh, these are called polynomials. I think you guys know very well what these are. I just didn't know what they were called before. Um, so why did we have to learn this? Uh, this question is so popular that it's in its own meme. <laughs> so we still don't know how to do our taxes, yet we can do polynomials in our sleep. Um, so thanks a lot. Now, 
I don't have to do my taxes. I, I don't know how to do my taxes because I don't have to know how to do my taxes. Um, learning it in school 20 years ago would have been a complete waste of time because about two years after I graduated school, Estonia started doing taxes online. And I have no idea how that system works. Once a year, I log on, I see what the tax board has calculated, I press OK, and that's done. It takes me literally less than two minutes. So learning how to do my taxes would have been completely pointless. Uh, learning polynomials and understanding, well, that can land you a very well-paying job in this market today. So it's important to know how proactive services, and what's the point of proactive services, is doing things uh, in a way that people don't have to do them. Building public services so people don't have to know where they have to apply um, the service from, uh, what are they, what rights do they have, uh, when to apply something from somewhere. Uh, building a service that the state, who already knows if you're eligible for something, tells you, hey, we found out you had a baby last week, congratulations. Here are some things you're eligible for. By the way, in three weeks, you should name your baby. You can do that here, click here. That's basically how a proactive state should work. We're on that path, on that road, not quite there yet. And I have to start wrapping up. So tomorrow, what's our plan tomorrow? As I said, proactive services and life based event services, very important topic for us. Cross-border services, uh, building those, we just have a couple right now, uh, but in an ideal world, we would have everything uh, cross-border with our neighbor, close neighbors. Data use and data ownership, uh, data sharing with private sector, uh, not just the public sector. Moving to the cloud, a very important topic for us. Uh, so all of the systems that the public sector use would be in the cloud as well. AI, uh, that's a big topic. I would be happy to talk about it, but uh, that's a big part of our challenges for the next couple of years is uh, using AI um, having basically a public sector Siri or Alexa talking to people in a couple of years. Green ICT, uh, my favorite pet project as well. We're, when we're talking about green ICT, we're not talking about greening with ICT, we're talking about greening ICT itself. So making sure that our green or ICT doesn't have as big of a footprint as it does right now. And cybersecurity, big topic, of course, how to keep up with growing numbers of attacks and growing complexity of attacks. And making sure that we have up-to-date, very fast internet across Estonia. Uh, Estonia, like Iceland, is, is we have a lot of households and a lot of families that are in remote locations. Um, so, we have questions like you guys. Uh, we want to decide everything quickly, but you have to talk things through. That takes time. Of course, ethics, uh, especially when it comes to data, is a question always. Maintenance and financing of ICT. Keeping everything up to date is, of course, a challenge. Like you guys, we only have, well, we're a big country compared to you guys. We have three, four times more people, but it's still uh, our engineers and cybersecurity experts are the, the biggest uh, problem or the biggest wish we would have more of. 
as I said, increasing attack, uh, attacks and ICT use in private sector, not only public sector, and illiteracy. So people knowing uh, what they do online and how they do and how to protect themselves. And my last slide, and then we have a minute left. <laughs> this is the extra homework. <laughs> so uh, my master's is in proactive services and ethics. So just a couple questions to think about uh, when we build public services. And if we build public services proactively, um, does personal data, does my personal data fully belong to me or should the state intervene and not allow me to sell my data, for example, uh, or exchange my data? Uh, should the state step in and set boundaries? So does personal data really belong to me? Uh, how do proactive services affect our autonomy, our right to decide when and how I want things? And should we allow opting out of digital states? Should we allow people to decide to be completely off grid and not share any data? Estonia has chosen not to build uh, a opt out state because uh, we just can't afford to have many different states in one country. Uh, but it's always an interesting topic to discuss. So these are my lessons uh, to share. I hope that was something you uh, was expecting and I answered some of your questions. Thank you very much, Katie. Thank you, very much. Uh, absolutely. Thank you so much for sharing your thoughts and, and your guidance and, and I hope this friendship and cooperation between the countries will continue because we have a lot to learn and this was really inspiring to hear. Uh, you ended on the note of ethics, uh, very uh, intriguing questions, of course, something we have to uh, consider as well. Uh, a lot of questions we have here generally have to do with uh, access for the elderly and, and people who are not used to using digital systems for, for services and that's something mm. we have to, of course, look into. And then there's one question also about digital voting. Uh, there's a person here who is asking, um, like, how do you or do you have any, any methods to prevent uh, people from interfering with voting, like uh, parents of, 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 of children who have just turned 18 and, and such? Mm -hmm. do you have well, the very important uh, way e-voting is built in Estonia is that you can cast your e-vote as many times as you want. Mm -hmm. So a physical vote, you go to the booth and you only give it once and that's it. Uh, and they make sure that nobody's in the booth with you. But the reason exactly for mm -hmm. being allowed to give your vote electronically as many times as you want during that period is exactly because of that. Mm -hmm. uh, so to make sure that even if you are starting to vote, <laughs> behind a computer and someone is standing over mm -hmm. your shoulder and telling you to vote for that person, mm -hmm. uh, you can do that and then just vote for someone else tomorrow um, and change your vote. There was an, actually a guy who tested this. How many times can he change his vote before someone gets worried? It's roughly around 330 times until the police <laughs> showed up. Because they literally want it, not because it, it's illegal. It's not. You can change it how many times. But police kind of started to get worried is something wrong. Uh, so he tested it. How many times can you change a vote during? It's a week-long process that online voting is open in Estonia. Uh -huh. So yeah, yeah. Uh, you can change your vote how many times you want. And your parents, unless they put you in a locker for a week, right. okay. can't really do anything about it. <laughs> I'm just afraid this is opening up a wormhole here for Icelanders. We are very indecisive people, usually. So <laughs> having the possibility of changing your vote 300 times, I don't know what it would lead to. But this is very interesting. So, so this was maybe like a trial and error uh, Yeah. But thing, uh, we kind of, I think we did it from day one this way. Uh, of course, um, uh, campaigning during that time mm -hmm. is not allowed. So, oh, and we are not uh, following the results in real time. So okay. e-voting results are published uh, at the same time as physical results, so all together. Uh -huh. So it doesn't affect, we don't uh, publicize e-voting results before the election day. Uh -huh. 
So. Very interesting. So thank you very much, Patty. You're welcome. How